you mentioned about a, a governance failure that happened that has led to a current Correct. situation that has been what's the history and what has been like what happened really in go- governance failure so what happens is whenever society faces a problem it has to create institutions which can then sort the problem yeah. right so when bangalore faced water scarcity in the 1960s it created the bangalore water supply and sewerage board a utility which had the capability to pump water from a far away source and bring it to the city and then also be able to set up sewerage networks and sewage treatment plants now because the utility was created it was then followed by the delhi jal board the chennai metro water and sewerage board and so on and so forth yeah. other cities built institutions which knew how to design for water and to design for sewerage networks so these were all 20th century institutions in the 21st century which is what we occupy water is no longer one of supply side there's in the 20th century there was water everywhere you built a dam you used pumps and you brought it to the city so that that's the skill you needed now demand management ecological restoration social justice these are the angles that which we need to um, have our institutions with just to give you an example the bangalore water supply and sewerage board does not have a single hydrogeologist the city has 500000 bore wells at least it pumps out 600 million liters per day but the institution does not have a single hydrogeologist who is able to understand groundwater so groundwater does not exist for the institution which is supposed to be supplying water to the citizens of bangalore so unless institutions are capacitated have the right human resources skills and in the case of the river basin for example if we have a river basin institution which understands the river manages the old forest manages the sand manages the catchment so that the river flows continuously and clearly the river will not be managed we'll fight about the waters we don't have a river basin institutions so we need to create the right institutions and we need to capacitate these institutions with human resources and financial resources to be able to deliver solutions otherwise we'll be putting bandaid on chicken pox what chicken pox needs is a vaccination you can't treat every yeah. postule and be able to find a solution right so governance is at the heart of our water problems it's not water it's governance and it's good management and good governance means creating the right institutions and equipping the right in- people in the right institutions who are accountable but are also capable of de- delivering solutions what are the solutions that you and other activists have been proposing to the government to solve these issues one of the things which urban areas have to do is to take an approach called an integrated urban water management approach water is no longer something to be brought in pipes but you have to look at rainwater and see how rainwater harvesting can make best use of uh, the rain that falls on our head we have to look at our tanks and lakes which is our surface water see how we can create wetlands increase biodiversity and protect these tanks and lakes surface water bodies India is a groundwater civilization we are the world's largest user of groundwater as i told you the city itself has 500000 bore wells and 600 million liters per day so we'll have to look at aquifers and groundwater see how we can recharge the aquifers see how we can manage the aquifer from pollution make sure that it's free and then we have to take used water or waste water and convert it to a resource so iuwm then has this principle that all these forms of water has to be governed as one unit and then you have a solution but if you are going to govern it separately like pipe water with the bwssb lakes with the bbmp groundwater with the groundwater authority then there's very little coordination for solutions let's get the iuwm approach let's get the institution to look at it and let's involve citizens as part of the solution every citizen should be harvesting rain should be conserving water not wasting water should if possible in apartments have wastewater treatment plants which recycle water and everybody should recharge groundwater wherever it's possible if that happens then we don't have a problem at all and you mentioned there uh, the urban architects they don't know the historical significance of how water bodies are built and that is causing a lot of havoc in one of your earlier videos you have said that the way the parking have been made in mm-hmm. urban right everything is below the ground that's right so that's a very important thing that we are now learning like the water below our feet is very important and very precious that is what filled the wells but unfortunately we are doing double triple basement parking we are destroying the shallow aquifer we are pumping out water which is absolutely clean and scarce throwing it into the drains for 6 to 8 months there was a five star hotel built close to mount carmel college and one near make re circle they pumped out groundwater for 4 to 6 months completely emptying all the wells in the surrounding areas emptying the aquifer totally 
then you build these basement parkings and you put the car. The car is not only a villain when it's creating traffic jams, but even when it is parked, it's a villain there because it's damaging the aquifer and our water resources. So we have to think of our master plan and building bylaws by which these aquifers are protected. For example, if there has to be a parking created in a groundwater sensitive zone, we should have stilt parkings and FSI should permit the, the apartment to go up rather than to go down. But in areas where there is no aquifer that is to be damaged, their basement parking can be allowed. This will come from a clear understanding of geology, hydrogeology and groundwater for which we need to do a detailed groundwater map of the city and then plan. So all these things have to talk to each other. And then why, when government is aware of the issues, why is government It's not, not aware of the issue. The thing is, these are new emerging issues. And as I told you, if the institution does not have a hydrogeologist, who do you take this case yes. to, right? You can only write about it in the papers or do a podcast and talk about it. So one, there is a broadcaster, but very important, there's a receiver. The receiver should be able to understand what the broadcaster is giving and then be able to act on it. We are not creating the institutions which have the capability to listen and then to act on it. So therefore, we have to work on modifying our institutions which then will be capable of acting. I think part of the reason is our institutions have been rather than responsive reactionary. They wait for a large crisis to happen. Truly. Uh, so it's a, the, in economic terms you have something called the Kuznets curve which says that economies which are growing um, take time before they can mature and create institutions. Yes. Europe cleaned up its water bodies only in the 60s, 70s. The Thames in London was cleaned up only 20 years back, right? So it's yeah. not way back that it's cleaned up. So when you get a certain GDP and you get a certain per capita income, then you have the monies to be able to invest in protecting the environment and cleaning up the pollution sources. In India, it will take another 20 years to do it. We have to be patient in the 20 years not to do permanent damage. Whatever damage we do should be rectifiable, should be correctable, right? Only then will we be able to put our act together to clean it up. This is the inevitable cause of development in the capitalist economy, in the consumer economy. And we've got to be prepared for that. Patience is the name of the game. And I think there's enough awareness on water bodies right now, at least in Bangalore, that every day there is something in the newspaper regarding uh, fixing of the water bodies. So that is there. But still, we have not created an institution which is completely responsible for water body. It still requires the revenue department to do the boundary setting. And then it requires the BDA or the BBMP to put the fence. And then yet we are not able to protect it from pollution, from sewage, because the BWS is we cannot act and so on and so forth. With all these public pressure, with all the high court and NGT working on it, Yet we lack the right institution to govern. So you can imagine how long it will take for us to be able to repair. Right now it's in the, the responsibility of the KTCDA, the Karnataka Town and um, the Karnataka Tank Conservation Development Authority, right? But that's a minor irrigation department institution. It doesn't understand urban waters as much as it does rural waters, right? So we still need to fix the institution. Yeah. Time. Bangalore infrastructure, everybody is aware of, right? Yes. Uh, for example, one of the issues is when the rain starts in right. April and May, every year there is flooding in right. the outer parts of Bangalore. Yes. Uh, like Divyashari 99 is one of the most popular societies in Bangalore, known for its millionaires. But the joke is every year it gets submerged. That's true. Uh, why does it happen? Like, is, is it not planned? The infrastructure is not planned? Two things are happening in the city. One, because of climate change and urban heat island, the intensity of rainfall is increasing. Yeah. We were previously designing for a 60 millimeter per hour intensity rainfall. Now, rainfall intensities for short bursts of time are recorded at 240 millimeters an hour. 180 millimeter per hour is the norm. So you're getting a large volume of water in a very short duration, which are stormwater drains or rainwater pipes are not prepared for. One, two. Previously, when it used to rain, there used to be enough absorption capacity in the city where water would percolate into the soil, into the ground. Now we are paved so much. So the runoff has increased from what used to be 15% to 95%. You have a fourfold increase in intensity of rainfall, a sixfold increase in the runoff. The combination of both means that it overwhelms our uh, capacity to drain the city. So therefore, floods will be the norm as things go along, unless every house, every residence becomes responsible for what we have now designed as a policy for Bangalore for 60 millimeters of rainfall, saying that for 
every square meter of roof area, 60 millimeter of rain, you either hold on in your rainwater tanks or you recharge through a recharge well. Then you have both climate change and flooding mitigation, but also the groundwater table coming up. This has to be sold to every citizen in Bangalore. Every building, every apartment, every institution should be doing rainwater harvesting. Then we can avoid floods. Otherwise, doesn't matter how rich you are. If somebody upstream is leaving the water out, you will be drowned. You, you can't fight against nature and the destruction that you're causing to it. This is a community effort, right? Individually, you can't yeah. live in an island or a bubble for long. But, but it's uh, at uh, loggerheads with capitalism where everybody is thinking individually for themselves and building the largest houses possible, which are getting submerged during those times. Yes. So you have Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar, as yeah. Rohini Nilikini puts it so beautifully. So the Bazaar is the marketplace. The Bazaar cannot be the sole determinant of how we live. Samaj has to say these are the norms yeah. and we have to follow. And Sarkar has to make sure the regulations are in place so that they are followed, the master plan and the bylaws and what can be built and what cannot be built. All three need to work together synchronously. If one of them dominates, then there is an imbalance and that causes a problem. Do you see somewhere in the future or is it already in the plan that government enforcing the solution that you told that have these kind of tanks? So, in? This is best expressed in Hindi because we seem to listen to the danda more than persuasion. Yeah. What, with the rainwater harvesting bylaw as an example, what Jailalita, Madam Jailalita, who was the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, did was she said that in six months you do rainwater harvesting or I'll cut off your electricity supply. So people complied very well. In Bangalore, we have said, Ki, Bhaiya, kar lo. Aapke liye achha hai. it's good for you, please do it. Otherwise, we'll give you a 25% increase in the water bill. Now, that water bill is so ridiculously yes. low that 25% doesn't make a difference. Six months later, we'll increase it by 50%. People are willing to pay that 50% increase, fine, but not do rainwater harvesting. How do we create a democratic society where people act as citizens? We clamor for our rights, but we have also to do our fundamental duties and carry out our responsibilities. If the citizenry does not join in the solution-seeking space, if we just simply get greedy about ourselves, then there is no lit uh, solution that comes to us. We have to mature as a society. Our uh, sense of responsibility to others, like for example in Japan or in Singapore, everybody is taking care of the other, right? That's the sense that we have to develop as the generation progresses. If we don't do that, then we are in trouble.